Good morning. Welcome morning. to Life Point Welcome Church. Life Glad you chose Glad to join chose us today. To join us and pray that our and services our meet services all your spiritual needs. If you're listening if you're live listening today, today, online, we online, want to say welcome, say to, you welcome well. to you as well. And if you're new, and to, if you're us, new to us, please type in the word welcome on a text message. Send that to us at 660-218-1202. That's on your screen or at the bottom of your screen there today. And also, if you have a prayer request, you can type the word prayer to that same number, 660-218-1202. We want to ask and invite, invite you uh, to join us uh, as we join worship us, God this morning. God but before we do that, we do want, that, want to remind everybody that since COVID has happened, it's happened, changed a few changed things. things. We no longer, we no longer pass, pass the offering plates, uh, but we do uh, collect, we an, offering do collect, collect an offering on your way out the door. Out the if, door. You'd like if you'd like to support the ministry and the mission of what Life Point Church is all about, you can drop your gift in there as you leave. Also, want to remind you that if you have children with us today and you would like to pick them up, you can return back the way you came in through the lobby. If you don't have children, you're able to actually exit Right here, right here to my here, left, your right, 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 out of the auditorium today auditorium when the service today, is over. Service is if you're over. online with us and you'd like to be a part of giving as well to LifePoint, you can do that by going to our website at lifepoint.ws. Go to that giving tab and you can follow the instructions there. Also, you may want to text your gift, whether online or here with us this morning, to 84321. Just put the amount in, text the 84321, and they'll give you instructions back in a text message how you can be a part and do that. 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 God bless you. God We're bless so glad you. that you joined us. You joined Let's us. go to the Lord Let's in prayer this morning as we began worshiping, worshiping together. God, we, together. God, we love you and we thank you. We, we praise you. you. God, I just pray God, that you would be with each and every person here today, that you would guide us, that you would direct us, that you would lead us to an understanding of who you are and what you have for our lives. So God, we love you and we thank you. Just guide us at this time. It's your name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Let's worship together. Let's worship together. everybody here. Um, as we begin our worship this morning, if you would stand as you are able and join us in praising the Lord.
you were running a good race. Who you were running or what a good race? Got in front of Who you to or what you got up. in front of you get to trip you up? Get back, get back in the, in the fight. God has get back in the race. God has called you to be a champion. He's called you to be more than an overcomer. You, you, are, a you are a conqueror in so Christ Jesus. Right now, today, to so I'm calling you right now today to take down every principality and power that stands in your way. To take down wickedness in high places in his power and strength. And to say to every mountain in your way, be uprooted and thrown into the sea. Because greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. And nothing shall be impossible for us that believe. Believe in him. Believe in the Son of God right now. And even if you've been contained, even if you've been isolated, even if you've been depressed and down, right now God is calling you back into his presence again to take hold of the word of God like a double-edged sword in your mouth and command your day to be different, command your life to turn around. God has given us the word to be powerful and effective and praise him. Praise him in the morning, praise him in the evening, praise him all day long because God says... I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a future and a hope. Good morning again. Good to be with you guys. Excited to see what God. Good morning. Doing. Welcome to Life Point Church. Glad you chose to join us today and pray that our and, services uh, so meet you all your spiritual needs. If you spend some time with you, we're starting a new series called Rise Up. And listening I live today we're online with Christian men and women need to rise up. And I was telling them this morning that uh, I don't want to make it a political thing. We want to uh, say what? But I believe that we have real reason to make sure that you go to the poll and you vote. I'm not even asking if you're Democrat or Republican or anything like that, but we should rise up. You know, the, I, my dad taught me a principle when I was growing up, and that principle was this. A need seen is an assignment given. If I see a piece of paper on the floor, it's not somebody else's job. It's my job to pick it up throw it away. And uh, I am excited to be a part of a group of people at Life Point Church that are people that assume responsibility that God has called us to go ye therefore and make disciples, to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe everything that he's commanded us, and surely he's with us always, even to the end of the age. We have a responsibility, and it's to share Jesus uh, without fear or consequence, that we would just be the people of God. You know, uh, our purpose here at LifePoint is to know God and make God known. And that's why it says on our vans out there, the process of that is living, loving, and leading. That we'd live it out in our everyday life, that we would lead other people to know Jesus is, and we'd love all men and women, right, of God. And so here we are. You know, the Bible teaches us that uh, by this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Nehemiah is who we're going to be talking about this month. I'm excited to get to really break it apart and go through the book of Nehemiah. Uh, this is my first time to ever preach uh, on this scripture. And, and uh, I was actually, I mean, I've been preaching since I was 19 years old and I'm 45 now. So that's quite a deal to look back and go, wow, I don't guess I ever preached uh, out of Nehemiah. But man, there's so much good that you and I can draw from Nehemiah when we start looking about uh, rising up uh, on the occasion. If you've got your Bibles, open them up to Nehemiah chapter 1. And we're going to start there. We'll work our way through the rest of the month of Nehemiah. But chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, and then that's all of chapter 1, 11 simple verses. And then I want to give you six of the verses out of chapter 2 to kind of keep everything in context and keep us moving in the same direction. Now, I want to talk about grandiose vision. I don't know how many of y'all are big dreamers out there. Anybody? Yeah, I'm a big dreamer. I dream big. Angie helps keep me in check. And that's important in life that you have somebody that's realistic and somebody that's a dreamer. Uh, but, but he had a big dream and, and God uh, had a movement for him uh, to, to partake in. Look with me, Nehemiah chapter 1, 1 through 11. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th, uh, 20th year, while I was a, in, the, in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile. So we're talking about a period in which the Jews had messed up again. I don't want to be hard on them, 
um, because I'm a lot like the Jews. I have a while in my life where I walk with God really good, really good, really good, really good, and then I stumble. You ever been there? You might be more spiritual than me, but your pastor is, it's rough. I don't care who you are. It's tough. To, to, uh, I, it should be no problem for me. I'm in the word, but I have those moments of weakness, you know, when somebody cuts me off and my mind is not where it should be. I know it never happened to you. Um, when one of my kids don't behave the way they're supposed to behave, uh, uh, you know, it's, sometimes it's easy to act like a Christian but not react like a Christian. You all with me? And so I have had times in my life that I can look and go, man, I really messed that up, God. I really didn't probably make you proud in that state or that way. Or... The Israelites went through those times. They went through times when they were following God really good, and then they went through times that they got mixed up with other people groups, with Gentiles that had other foreign gods, and they would begin to serve those gods. And throughout time, God gets their attention by allowing them to, in this case, be exiled, to be scattered, to be slaves in some senses. But the cool thing is God, when he hears his people's uh, heart and, and hears their uh, asking forgiveness, he'll bring them back. Look what it goes on to say here. He asked about this Jewish remnant that had survived the exile. So they're on the healing side. They're walking with God. And also he asked about the city of Jerusalem. They said to me, uh, Nehemiah says, those who survived the exile are back in the province. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. So what a disgrace. The city, I mean, the city was known by its great walls and how beautiful and how great the architecture was. And gates were very important as well, but these gates had been burned, so there was burned gates and piles of rubble everywhere. It must have looked really nasty. The walls of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Verse 4, when I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. For some days, I mourned and I fasted and prayed before God of heaven. Then I said, here's how he prayed, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, uh, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. I have acted very, uh, or we have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed your commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instructions you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me I obey, and obey my commands, then even if your people, or even if ex, your exiled people are at the furthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your, and your people whom you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayers of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servants access, or success, sorry. Give your servants success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. And Nehemiah has this spot that he's in. He's the cupbearer of a Gentile king. And he sees from a distance by hearing from his friends that his hometown, that his people, they're living in disgrace and it's been disgraced. That they're back and they're beginning to follow God, but, but things are not good. Chapter 2, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year, King Artaxerxes, I always have a hard time with that. When wine was brought for, uh, when, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine. This is Nehemiah. I took the wine and I gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, "Why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart." 
I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to, my, to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked, him asked me, how long will your journey take and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me. So I set a time. I pray God will bless the reading of his word today. You and I have so much to learn from God's word as we start looking at this grandiose vision that God has laid on the heart of his people. If you're online with us today, we want to invite you to find your listening guide there at lifepoint.ws, right at the top of the page. It says digital listening guide. You can click on that today and it'll open up for you. And join along with us as we uh, discover God's word for us. You know, I believe that, that none of us should leave here the same as we came in today. I believe that God has uniquely and, and strategically and intentionally put you here today to receive a word from his scripture that would change our life, that we would not just be hearers of the word, but that we would be doers of it as well. And if you've got your listening guide, the very first thing is that Nehemiah recognized the troubles of other people. He recognized the troubles of other people. I mean, this is the, wouldn't this be a grandiose vision if we would actually be concerned about other people more so than ourselves? When we would think higher of others than of ourselves, when, 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 like we said just a little bit ago in John 35, when he says that by this all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. I mean, the Bible says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And the second commandment is likened unto the first, to love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, wouldn't it be something if we actually thought about one another? If we actually really did that? We, we wanted to know what was going on with our neighbors. We wanted to know how their day was going. If you look with me again in verse 2, Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah and with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile. I asked him, I, I ask him how are you doing? Now, sometimes there's people you don't want to ask that, amen? Because they're going to tell you about their hangnail and how many days they've been constipated. I know. I've, I, I've stepped into that more times than I care to say. And it's like, wow, <laughs> too much information. You know what I'm saying? I, I could have used... Uh, but, but no, I am genuinely concerned. I, I am gen, genuinely wanting to know how you're doing. And I want you to know something. I, I don't think he would have cared how they answered him because he's such a great example. Hananiah living in this position where he's the cupbearer to the king, one of the most important positions in all the kingdom. And he's the guy that, that, that he's, a, he's a Jew uh, was in exile, but now he's living in the king's kingdom. He's eating in the king's house. Man, he's got it all together, but he still is concerned about his neighbor. He's still concerned even though things aren't as great for them as they are for him. And he's saying, how's it going? And he's asking not only about the people, but about the city. There was a Dutch diamond collector that was seeking a pretty rare diamond, and so he put the word out. And a dealer in New York by the name of Mr. Winston Heard of this inquiry and contacted him, letting him know that he believed that he possessed the diamond that this guy is looking for. So the diamond collector made arrangements, and he went to see Mr. Winston. And Mr. Winston had a salesman present the diamond. The salesman described all the technical aspects of the diamond. However, within minutes, the diamond collector rose his hand, and he said that, is, uh, that this was not what he was looking for. Watching from a distance, Mr. Winston hurried and intercepted him as he was walking out, and he asked him if he could present the diamond again, and the collector agreed, sure. Mr. Winston pulled out the same diamond and started describing his admiration for the particular diamond. Within minutes, they were signing papers, and he purchased the diamond, and as the gentleman was walking out, he asked, what just happened? Why was it easy for me to say no to your salesman a little while ago while with you I purchased 
the diamond in just moments. Mr. Winston answered, that salesman is the best in the business. He knows more about diamonds than anyone, including myself. And I pay him a large salary for his knowledge and his expertise, but I would gladly pay him twice as much if I could put into him something I have which he lacks. You see, he knows diamonds, but I love diamonds. The truth is, uh, the same in soul winning. Many Christians have much Bible knowledge but do not share Christ with a lost person, while others may not have as much knowledge of the Bible, but they love Christ so much they tell others about him and press them to accept Jesus as Savior and Lord. There's an old thing that I learned and when I was in the military. I was a combat medic. And whenever you're um, going to try to help somebody that's unconscious, you want to look, listen, and feel. And so I would put my head over their mouth and I would listen for breathing and feel if they're breathing on my cheek and I would watch to see if they would rise and the, the chest would rise and fall. There's a different look, listen, and feel. I believe people and our feelings and the things in our life that are going on that we need to validate those things, that they're real. I mean, I tell people 90% of perception is how you perceive what somebody said to you. So if they offended you, chances are that that was your reality. That's the way you understood it to be said, even if they may not have meant it. You ever had that happen to you? I mean, if you're a husband and a wife, you might have gone through that a time or two. We need to look, listen, and feel, and feel. I see Nehemiah, the king, actually did this, even though the king wasn't the Jew, but he was actually seeing and listening and feeling and going through the things with Nehemiah. In, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, in the month of Nisan, the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, he took the wine, he gave it to the king. I had not been, uh, I had not been sad, he says, Nehemiah in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look sad when you're not ill? This could be nothing but sadness of heart. See, I underlined that. He's looking, isn't he? He's asking a question, and he's ready to listen. He is acknowledging Nehemiah's feelings. I mean, in verse 4, the king said to me, what is it that you want? Galatians chapter 6, verse 2 actually tells us this way for us New Testament people. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Man, I'm going to tell you something. If you're a part of LifePoint, I tell people, okay. So, so we had a, a meeting during this hour uh, of uh, service. There's every second Sunday second service, there's a class called Starting Point, where if you're curious of how you can be a member, how you can be an active role and part in Life Point, you come to that class, we share with you how, if you want to sign to be a member, we want you to do that. Because membership is like the next level. Many of you, if you come one time and you come a second time, we don't call you a visitor or a guest anymore. You're now a part of us, but we label you an attender. You're an attendee, but we want you to get to the place that you're a member, that you are all the way a part of us. But I'm going to tell you something. You're family if you just show up. If you come regularly, we count you as a part of the family. Wouldn't it, isn't it awesome? I mean, some of you all have had this experience, but isn't it awesome that whenever you're burdened with something, that your family comes alongside you, they walk with you, they pray with you, they, they help with guidance and all those things, and that's kind of who we get to be, amen? Isn't that wonderful that we're not alone, that we don't have to do life by ourselves, that we can have an avenue in which we... I had uh, Sharon Spieler call me this week, and she's sitting right there, say hi, Sharon. Called me this week and had a friend that needed prayer. Wasn't it awesome that you could call and say, Pastor, put this on our prayer chain. Let people know so that we can be praying. And she had confidence and knows that that's what kind of family we have that will carry one another's burdens together uh, for what God has in each one of our lives. Here's the next thing. Knowledge of brokenness can be heartbreaking. Knowledge of brokenness can be heartbreaking. You know, when... Uh, uh, I've heard it said, I think it's one in 12 churches right now are closing due to the coronavirus. They're never opening again. Financially, they can't make it. We've been blessed. I mean, God, because your obedience and what you guys do, we've been blessed. 
So we're not in danger of that, but there are churches that are closing. That doesn't bring me joy. That breaks my heart. There are pastors today, listen, that have fallen to sin, that have uh, uh, gone astray from what the Lord would have them to do, and, and they've left the ministry. They've been forced out of the ministry. That doesn't bring joy to my life. That brings heartbreak to my life. There are people that have been in church for decades and for years and they've fallen away and they've gotten away from God and they're living a life of sin and doing apart from God what God doesn't want. That doesn't bring me joy. That brings me heartbreak today. And I would pray that it brings us as believers heartbreak that, that we wouldn't look at it and go, well, you know, at least we're good and, you know, no big deal. No, it ought to knowledge of this brokenness sh- should bring about heartbreak. They said to me, those who survived the exile, verse 3, and are back in the province are in great trouble and great disgrace. The walls of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. There was a guy named Mel Trotter. He was a famous rescue mission worker. He was the son of a bartender who drank as much as he served. Trotter followed his father's footsteps, losing job after job because of his addiction to drinking and gambling. Each time he lost a job, he promised to reform and start doing better. But each time he failed. After the death of his baby son, Trotter made his way to Chicago where he intended to drown himself in Lake Michigan. He had sold his shoes to get money for another drink and was walking barefoot through the snow toward his death when he went inside the Pacific Garden Mission and he was saved. He found Jesus. For the next 40 years, Trotter did everything he could to help those like himself who had fallen prey to the deceptive, alluring temptations of sin. Satan's advertising is never realistic. He paints beautiful pictures of immediate pleasure, ignoring the real consequences that its participants must endure. If the beer companies ran ads filled with crashed cars, paralyzed drinkers, and the tiny caskets of babies killed by drunk drivers... It would not help them sell their product. So they focus on the beginning rather than the end. But no matter how beautiful the temptation appears, it is only a cloak for the reality that sin always ends in pain, heartbreak, and judgment. James chapter 1, verse 15, it says, Sin, when it is finished, brings about death. Ezekiel 36, 31 through 33 Ezekiel's telling the people of Israel, then you will remember your evil ways and wicked deeds, and you will loathe yourselves for your sins and detestable practices. I want you to know that I am not doing this for your sake, declares the sovereign Lord. Be ashamed and disgraced for your conduct, people of Israel. Remember what he said just a minute ago in our main scripture? They were disgraced. Their walls had been torn down. They had been apart from God. They had not followed the ways. This is what the sovereign Lord says there in Ezekiel 36, 33. On that day, I cleansed you from all of your sins. I will resettle your towns and the ruins will be rebuilt. Man, I'm going to tell you, I don't know what's going on in your world today, but I want to tell you, Jesus is the God of restoration. He rebuilds what the devil tried to tear down. God can overcome any sickness, any injury, any junk, any sin in our life. Nehemiah chapter 1, 5 through 9, the Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant a love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. And then he does what? He says, I confess my sins, the sins of my daddy and the sins of all these people. I confess. Remember the instructions you gave your servant Moses in verse 8. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, if you return to me, if you confess, if you get right with God, then even if your exiled people are the farthest horizon away, I will gather them from afar and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. My daddy used to preach. He preached 30 some years and I'll never forget one of the sermons that he talked about was when he was preaching about sin. He had three points, and he used to say this. Sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Amen? 
It'll take you further than you wanted to go, keep you longer than you wanted to stay, cost you more than you wanted to pay. Knowledge of brokenness is heartbreaking. But knowledge, acknowledgement, validating these heartbreaks is not enough. Here's the last one. Do something about it. Do something about it. Nehemiah chapter 2, 4 through 5, the king said to me, what is it you want? Man, that's scary, isn't it? How do you answer a king that he can lop off your head at any moment, that he can, he can be angry because you don't want to be there beside his side, that, that you want to put other people, not his people, first in your life? I mean, this, this is scary for this guy. He doesn't really know how this king is going to react. He asked him, what do you want from me? The very next words, he says, then I prayed to the God of heaven. I love that. Before I did anything else, before I said anything else, I could just see his prayer. It wasn't like a long, lengthy prayer. I mean, he was in a conversation. It wasn't like he could say, just a minute, I got to pray. I'll get right back to you. So in moments, just in his mind, he must have prayed something like, God, help me. You ever done that? God, help me. I don't even know what I'm asking for right now, but God, you got to lead my mouth. God, you got to lead my heart. God, you got to change my activity. God, it's all on you. And I answered the king in verse 5, if it pleased the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city of Judah where my ancestors are buried, my, my family, so that I can rebuild it. I need seen as an assignment given. He wasn't telling those guys that came and told him the report about how bad things were. He wasn't telling them, hey, you need to go rebuild that. Instantly in his heart, he felt that God wanted him to do something. I tell people, you know, you got to, you want to do, we say yes to ministry in this church. So you come to me with an idea and say, Pastor, I've been thinking and praying. I think we need to have this ministry to little babies. And I'm like, guess what? I think you're right and you're the one to lead it. People are like, oh, I don't know if I should tell him about it. Amen. With great position comes great responsibility. A need seen is an assignment given. I love it when people think, hey, pastor, I really think that you should. And I'm like, I don't. I know God might be calling you to it, but don't be telling him how I should. Isaiah 6, 1 through 8, I love it. People say, you know, pastor, I'm not. I can't lead anything. I don't know enough scripture. I, I mean, pastor, you don't know how bad I've been in my past. I mean, God's forgiven me, but he's still working on me. I mean, I'm a real piece of work. You know what I mean? Isaiah was a prophet, but he still knew the sin that had been in his heart and in his life. He tells us in Isaiah 6, 1 through 8, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. I love the description of what he's seen. Above him were seraphim, that's angels, with, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet. With two they were flying and they were calling to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. And the whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Man, I, hey, we got them smoke machines out back, don't we? Somebody, we can have smoke in here. And the whole temple was filled with smoke. Okay, maybe it's not, yeah. I think it'd be cool. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. He was saying, I'm a sinner, and I live among sinners. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Woe is me. I am doomed. I am standing before Almighty God. Can you imagine? You know what? One day you and I will stand before the judgment throne of Christ. One day we will stand before him and he will see us. The cool thing is he doesn't see our, uh, our unrighteousness. He sees Jesus' righteousness in us. Praise God for that. Amen. But it would be a scary thing and that's where he's at. Woe is me. Then I love this picture of salvation. One of the angels 
One of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tong- with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth, and he said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin atoned for. Atoned for. It's been paid for. How much did it cost? It cost Jesus his life. But guess what? Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead. Death and hell couldn't hold him because he was perfect. He was without flaw. He was without sin. I paid for it. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, what voice? The Lord. I don't know about you, but when I'm sitting in church, oftentimes I hear the voice of the Lord. Now, I don't hear him audibly, but I hear him in a still, small voice. And that heart's cry in my heart, in my innermost being, I, it's kind of like a guilty conscience. I tell people I don't believe in that. I believe that that's the conviction. That's what he sounds like. I can hear that still, small voice speaking to me. And just like this day, probably as loud as that sometimes, then the voice of the Lord said, Who shall I send, and who will go for us? And then Isaiah says, here I am, send me. I may not be perfect, but send me. I may not be the best example all the time, but send me. I'm willing, God, because you have changed me. You touched my lips. You cleansed me. You made me whole. Rise up. It's a grandiose vision. John 13, 35. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. So I don't like to just leave you with a bunch of preaching and say, okay, good, good sermon. See you later, pastor. But I want to give you a next step this week. You all ready for it? You can write it down. Your next step is admit that there are needs right around us. Let's commit to doing something about it. Maybe your neighbor is struggling. How will you show him God's love? Maybe your brother or your sister has fallen to sin. How will we restore them gently? I had to share this, you know, it's, it's, it's the word gently. John chapter 3, 16, and then verse 17. You know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. But 17 says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him would be saved. So if Jesus didn't come to condemn you, what did he come to do? To save you. And we need to restore our brother and sister gently. It's it's okay to look at him and say, you and I know that you're not living right. I love you, but Jesus loves you more. Don't change for me, but would you change for him? Because he gave his life for you. It's that simple. See the needs. A need seen is an assignment given. Amen? Pray with me. Lord, I love you. God, I thank you for your blessings today. I thank you for this time that we can be in your house. God, that we can be used by you. Father, I pray that you just guide us and direct us and, and just be with us in every way today. Lord, we love you and we thank you and we praise you. It's in your son's name we do pray. Amen. This is an invitation, if you would stand with me. If you're online with us, we want to ask you to call in to that prayer line. It's going across the bottom of the screen. You might also uh, text the word prayer to 660-218-1202. Send us your prayer request today. Today, if you're here in the audience with us, we would love for you to come and take one of us by the hand. Angie's up here with me today. We want to pray with you. Listen, friend, we know that you're not perfect. We're not perfect. But Jesus is perfect. Jesus has a way of restoring that relationship with us like only he can do. Would you come today? Begin to rebuild the walls in your heart. Let it begin today. sure by now God you would have reached out and wiped our tears away stepped in and saved the day 
but once again I'll say amen and it's still raining and as the thunder rolls I barely hear you whisper through Hallelujah. Amen. You can be seated just for a moment here. Thank you again for attending today. Excited that you did. Those of you online, got a few announcements for you. You guys got those on your listing guide, so I won't repeat all of them. I do want to point out one thing, though, coming up. It was October the 17th. We've actually had to cancel our fall uh, get-together out at the Bohan's house. Uh, we've got, gosh, I think I, I counted 10 or 11 people that have contracted COVID that are a part of our church. And that's been tough for us. We've been praying for them. Maybe you know somebody that's contracted COVID. I tell people, we don't think it happened here, <laughs> but it could happen in Walmart or anywhere, this unseen thing. Uh, also, you might've noticed that our coffee shop was closed today. It'll be closed this week and next week. We're gonna have free donuts for you and coffee and water. We're doing that just to clean because we had somebody come through that was in contact with a couple of our ladies in the back, and they got called and asked to quarantine. So we said, no problem. We'll do that. We'll shut it down. We just didn't want to have the whole place shut down, so that's easy enough for us. And, you know, like always, we keep up cleaning well. We do cleanings twice as much as we used to, and so uh, we are working hard to keep everybody as healthy as we can here, and we want to thank you again for that. Instead of reading the rest of it, I wanted to take just a minute to personally say thank you guys financially for your generosity. I tell people it's not equal giving, it's equal sacrifice. Amen? 
Uh, I, I remember the story about the lady with the two mites, and she walked in front of them, you know, used to in those days, they would walk in front of everybody, and they would leave their offering at the front. And so everybody would see what you gave, and this lady gave her two widow's mites. It was like two pennies. And Jesus commended her because he said, even though all these other people gave more money, she gave all she had. She gave it all, 100%. So that was pretty amazing to me. So I want you to know it's your heart, it's not the amount. And because we're all faithful to what God leads on our heart to give, the Bible says, give on your heart what you should, give what God lays on your heart that you should give. Because God loves a cheerful giver. Don't do it out of um, guilting. Don't do it out of uh, uh, anything else, okay? It's not, we, we want you to know we love you, and, and we're glad you're here whether you could ever give a sin or not, and uh, we're going to love you the same as anyone else. So we're excited about that. And it leads me into the last thing I want to remind you guys. Some of you are new with us. You don't know, but three years ago, I felt like God was leading me to do a special offering in the month of December where everything that we took in went toward the ministry of our church for the next year to try to help fund the ministry. Now, you all know that the rest of our money that comes in, it pays for building costs, it pays for um, uh, utilities, salaries, that stuff. But we wanted to make sure that each year that our ministries were taken care of. And so we, first year I set a, 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 a thing at $25,000 and you guys brought in thirty one. dollars Last year we set... We thought, well, thirty was pretty good, so we'll try um, thirty-five thousand because I want to challenge you a little bit. So last year we brought in like forty something. Well, this year, what we want to do is we've got this extra loan that we got. How many of y'all like our flat parking lot with no dips in the outs? You know, like y'all remember, you could lose your car inside some of the holes that were out there, right? And so a couple of the guys decided we went. And we got a loan. Uh, it was forty-four thousand dollars to pave that parking lot out there. It seems like a lot, uh, and it was, um, but we were able to, with a gift of $10,000, to pay $10,000 down, and the guy that we took the loan from actually owns the other buildings across the way. So he had his parking lot done. He did, helped us do ours, and I told him, he said, you know, if you don't make us pay monthly, we'll try to pay it off at Christmas. So we need to raise another $34,000 to pay the parking lot off, and our mission ministry money for that for the month of December is right at uh, what I tell them um, twenty thousand or something like that. So it's around fifty four thousand dollars that we need to raise this year if we want to pay off the parking lot and fund the ministry. Amen. Are y'all in with me? It's scary. I mean, I'm just throwing a number out there saying, God, you know, I'm going, dear God, <laughs> right now. But I believe we can, and I just want you to pray about it and know that everything we take in the offering in the month of December will go towards that. It won't go towards salaries, won't go towards, it's going towards that. And so if you guys want to help us out, we want to ask you to do that. We believe we can have another big December, but we are looking forward to getting that paid off so that we can pay this great building off. Some of y'all don't know. I'm going to tell you why I'm talking. It cost us $680,000 to purchase and build this building. It's worth $1.2 million. Praise God. Amen. Amen. That's because that's we had so much help from you guys to do it, and uh, we're thankful for that. But I believe if we can raise $50,000 this year for the parking lot, and we keep doing that year after year, we can have this thing paid off in four, five, six years. Amen. And we can have something for our children's children down the road. But again, I want to thank you for your generosity, and this is because you guys are faithful to God. Uh, we're just glad that we can serve you, be here, and just honor God in that. And I pray that you guys come see us again next week, that you tell your friends and your family, we pack this place out. Amen? God bless you. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you again. We praise you for your blessings today. Thank you for those that are here. Pray that you guide them and direct them and give them strength for this week. God, I pray for uh, uh, the needs, God, um, for the hurts. Uh, for the hang-ups. God, that you would just continue to speak in our, hear, in our ear, that we would hear your voice, that, God, we would know that you're enough. You're enough to fulfill everything in our life. And it's in your name we do pray. Amen. God bless you. See you next week.